Hello and welcome to another live stream uh, on the UFO topic from the Den of Geek. I am the Den of Geek resident UFO expert, Alejandro Rojas, and uh, we've got a great show for you today. We've got a gentleman named David Marler. Now, if you're into the UFO topic, you definitely should be watching a television show called Unidentified. In fact, in a recent Den of Geek article, I had noted how this show is like no other show on television, perhaps ever before, in that, you know, it is aiding in getting the Senate to actually look into UFOs. So kind of a remarkable situation. And this last episode was all about triangular UFOs. And one of the key central figures in that episode was one of the best UFO uh, triangle researchers out there, and that is David Marler. So let's bring him on. Hello, David. Alejandro, good to see you. So you did a great job, uh, I got to say, on the episode. Thank you. Thank you. It was it was actually very enjoyable uh, working with the production crew as well as Chris Mellon. Mm -hmm. Now, I know you and you love great triangle <laughs> UFO cases. The more credible, the better. And you, you're the type to right. dig and to really uh, bring out those cases that have uh, the most credibility. So you must have been very excited that the show featured two brand new cases. Absolutely. Uh, I had actually been in touch with the production team and they had indicated they had some military witnesses step forward after season one had aired. And some of those included witnesses of these triangular UFOs. So I was very keen to watch that in lectures, which you probably have sat in on in the past. I've made the comment that it's interesting. We have reports of these triangular UFOs over civilian populations, over cornfields in southern Illinois but we never have reports in milita active mil military theater operations. And lo and behold, here are a couple of witnesses, so I stand corrected. And uh, very intriguing uh, descriptions on the part of the witnesses with regard to these triangular UFOs. And it's to the point now, and having looked at hundreds of these cases, and of course writing the book on the subject, when I hear the witnesses talk, I can almost finish their sentences because as you know, these reports are eerily similar and to me, that is suggestive, not conclusive by any means, but suggestive that people are essentially reporting the same thing, which is indicative of the fact that there is a genuine phenomenon here. Mm -hmm. When you say that you know what they're about to say with these cases, what are some of those characteristics that you commonly hear? Well, one, uh, which was demonstrated in the episode of Unidentified, they recreated it. You actually see the triangle moving with the flat side as the leading edge and the point of the triangle uh, trailing in the back. So when we think of conventional aerodynamic principles, when we look at conventional aircraft, uh, even going back to the British Vulcan bomber in the 1950s and 60s, uh, they do have a general triangular shape. However, uh, all aircraft that I know of, and I think you probably know of, usually travel with the point uh, as the leading edge, simply because that makes the most aerodynamic sense. Uh, in many of these cases, though, we have these triangles where the flat side is actually the leading edge and the point is trailing behind. And I've talked to aerospace experts at Boeing, McDonnell Douglas, and they'll be the first to tell you this makes absolutely no sense especially considering the fact that some of these triangles are not necessarily sleek in their, their profile. There's actually depth to these. In other words, uh, some have described them as uh, like a two-story building. So we're not just talking thin, sleek triangles. We're talking thick, double-decker triangles that move with the flat side as the leading edge. And you can imagine how much wind resistance that you would be dealing with. It's almost like driving a UPS truck uh, <laughs> in 50 mile an hour winds and you're driving directly into the wind. Um, it makes it very difficult. And so that's one of the characteristics. And of course, the complete absence of sound in most of these cases, mm -hmm. if we're dealing with any kind of engine and they do postulate in the episode, perhaps some of these witnesses in Hudson Valley in the 1980s saw some type of lighter than air vehicle or dirigible. Well, even dirigibles, as most of your audience probably knows, generate some type of noise. They do have propellers. Uh, I've been under blimps many times and have heard these. Uh, but coupled with that is the rapid rate of acceleration. In other words, from a dead stop, these things can hyper accelerate 
And there are there's no lighter than airship that we're aware of that can withstand that G-force. They're simply not designed for high velocity travel. Mm -hmm. And all of those things kind of indicate a uh, physics that is much different than what we're used to when designing aircraft, for instance. Point physics, physics and propulsion, correct. Mm -hmm. Which uh, adds to the mystery of these cases. So in the episode, you know, they were kind of speculating, what about black projects or some advanced right. aircraft that uh, these could be? But uh, even when they're talking about dirigibles, kind of like you mentioned, a lot of these characteristics you just listed out don't really fit. No, and it's ironic uh, as I watched the episode because I didn't get to see the final cut until everyone else did uh, this past Saturday. And it was interesting to see the dialogue at to the Stars Academy as the various individuals and some of whom, as you know, are in aerospace, were going back and forth trying to resolve and, and come to some understanding of what are we dealing with here? Is there a prosaic explanation for these triangular uh, UFOs? And I found it interesting that they were going through that same list of prosaic explanations that I did back in 2012, 2013, when I wrote my book, uh, because certainly any good UFO investigator, much like yourself, Alejandro, we don't go in with alien or extraterrestrial being at the top of our list. If anything, it's at the very bottom of the list after we've eliminated meteors, satellites, aircraft, hallucinations, temperature inversions. We go through that, that, that Rolodex, if you will, of possible explanations. Once we can cross all of those off the list, then we're forced to concede, as they did at the end of the episode in Unidentified, these things are something altogether different. And I would certainly echo that sentiment after looking at hundreds of cases. One thing that it was unfortunate is during the editing process, uh, we didn't get to touch on cases going back as far as the 1940s and 1950s. Uh, there was one reference that they used where I referenced the increase in sightings of these triangles occurring in the 1960s and the 1970s. I really wish we could have touched on some of the other scenes, which were unfortunately edited for time, because as you know, these reports go back decades. Now, uh, you know, you, you're very well aware that the Senate... Uh, Select Committee on Intelligence is requesting that uh, various agencies report, give uh, information on, you know, UAP reports. Um, right. Chris Mellon had mentioned in an interview that I did uh, in that article I mentioned for Den of Geek that, you know, these cases that they're showing on the show kind of help uh, make their argument that there are cases, that these cases exist. Yeah, are there many military cases out there and any that you think may show up in these reports? Uh, possibly. Uh, there were certainly some early military reports as early as 1949, Baltimore, Maryland from Project Blue Book files. There were also a number in British MOD files that were declassified. One that I just recently mentioned on a UK radio show I did just a, a day or two ago involved the near collision with a 737 that was coming from Milan to Manchester. And as the 737 was on final approach, this gray, dark, triangular, wedge-shaped object nearly hit the wing of this 737 as it was coming in for final approach. And this launched a CAA investigation, which is the equivalent of our FAA, uh, that lasted for a full year. And at the end of that investigation, they could not determine the origin uh, of this object. And so I, I think... When you look at those cases, those are the cases that should appear in the report simply because I, I use that as one of the strongest arguments against all of these being black military operations. Uh, and by that, I mean, if we have a multi-million or billion dollar aerospace project involving these radical aircraft, would we really fly it that dangerously close to a fully loaded commercial airliner? For one thing, you're risking exposure to the project, which, you know, for all intents and purposes is secret, I would assume, uh, based on the stealthy way these things have been flying around. But more importantly, would you truly risk the safety and security of an entire 737 with civilian passengers? I don't think so. And so that's one of the strongest arguments, and that is in the British Ministry of Defense file. So it'll be interesting to see if that and some of the earlier accounts from Project Blue Book uh, do actually surface. There's one from the 1960s 
which described the triangle moving. And there's a beautiful illustration in Project Blue Book files of this triangle with, again, the flat side as the leading edge. And there's arrows actually drawn on the witness sketch indicating the direction of movement. And in that sketch, we also have the characteristic white, big white light at each point of the triangle. So the characteristics are eerily similar. And I found it interesting too, because uh, David Clark, uh, who often makes skeptical claims about the UFO subject in the episode, as you may have seen, he made the, the supposition that, well, these people that saw the triangle or Chevron shaped UFO in the Hudson Valley, uh, a lot of that could be explained away by the fact that Star Wars came out in 1977 and people saw these triangular star destroyer aircraft or spaceships and that it, you know basically infused itself into the popular mindset so now people are i guess a hallucinating was his contention that they're seeing star destroyers in the sky well there's several arguments with that one of course being the fact that our friend uh, mutual friend lee spiegel was witness to a triangular ufo along with several police officers in lumberton north carolina in 1975 for a full week it was the first documented wave of these triangular UFOs. And by documented, I mean in newspaper accounts. And just uh, last week, I actually had the opportunity to interview Ron Thompson, who was one of the police officers back in 1975. And the description that he offers mirrors very much the modern day reports we have of these triangular UFOs. And I think it's important to state in 1975, or for that matter, in the 1960s, if you're going to fabricate a UFO story to fool UFO investigators, wouldn't you kind of draw it along the lines of what people are reporting at the time, which in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, were still flying saucers, primarily. Uh, certainly, there were egg-shaped objects and other things, but uh, suddenly these triangles start appearing. And so uh, we have multiple cases involving multiple police officers, as was shown in Unidentified, the case from 2000 that I personally invested investigated, but also a lot of police officers in and around the Hudson Valley back in the 1980s that described seeing these large silent triangles. And um, you have just this growing body of reports from credible witnesses. There are some people that are uh, more skeptical than others that can summarily discount all of these reports. When you have people traveling along the Taconic Parkway, a major freeway around the Hudson Valley area, and literally all the motorists stop their cars and the freeway comes to an entire halt and people are exiting their vehicles to look up. I don't think they suddenly simultaneously hallucinated they were seeing a star destroyer in the sky. Um, I think we have to take some of these reports quite seriously. Right, I mean, and that's what's to make light of, it. not to make light of it, but in a way, for instance, yesterday, I think it was, we watched Hamilton on Disney. Mm -hmm. But I don't see people, you know, I'm not hallucinating seeing Alexander Hamilton walk around <laughs> on the street. I mean, uh, I could see maybe misperceptions of triangular shaped, because uh, for instance, and this does happen where people see three lights in the sky and they assume it's a large triangular shaped object when Correct. often it's not, or right. even it's three lights from a plane. So Absolutely. that does happen. But in these cases you're talking about, there's a clear triangular shape. There is, and coupled with that, as you know, we have many of these triangular UFO reports that were captured on radar. That right. argument that argument completely dissipates in the face of that. When we have objective data in the form of radar tracking of these UFOs that correlate with both ground-based as well as air-based air witnesses, there was a case from 1953 in Albany, Georgia, Project Blue Book Files, a a uh, pilot was flying solo, a uh, solo night mission, and suddenly saw this very sharply defined circular light. And he thought it was much more distinct than your typical star or planet you would see that tends to scintillate somewhat in, in the sky. And so in the Blue Book report, again, directly from military files, this pilot decided, well, I'll increase altitude. If it doesn't change perspective, then obviously it's something celestial. But as he increased the altitude, within about two to three minutes, he suddenly realized the light that was above him was now below the plane. And so now this is obviously something else. He then, in the Blue Book report, descends and accelerates towards the object, trying to close on it. And as he sees this light, it starts oscillating between red, white, red, white, 
And it does this two or three times within in about a two to three second cycle. And then in the Blue Book report from 1953, it states, then the pilot stated the light turned into a perfect triangle, which then divided into two triangles and disappeared. Now, the Albany, Georgia airport in the Blue Book report states that they had an unknown radar target at the exact location and time of the pilot sighting. Now, you keep referencing Blue Book cases, and it's something, it's like a piece that I'm working on right now, and uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, and you being a longtime researcher will get it. Uh, what I'm trying to say here is that, you know, there's been this perception for the last few decades, while you and I have been, you know, our interest began and we began researching, but there's this perception that, you know, during those years that the Air Force was investigating UFOs, they didn't really find anything significant. Um, right. Mostly this is believed because that's what the Air Force has been saying over the sure. years. In fact, sure. furthermore, they've even been saying that, uh, that the military has not been interested since the close of Project Blue Book in these cases. Correct. Whereas you and I know not only have there been cases since Blue Book that the military has been interested in, in fact, some of these cases you're referring to are those, Absolutely. but that Project Blue Book was full of very good cases that despite very thorough research were never uh, solved. Absolutely. And it's so funny. And I'm glad you bring this point up because quite often people don't touch on this. Uh, many people, because of Blue Book and the fact that it came out as more of a public relations front, that being said, if you go through the files, there are good cases, to your point, cases that have been documented in other sources. So we're not just taking Blue Book at their word. We can find newspaper accounts. And I just worked on a case, as you know, from 1964 involving a burn victim. I found uh, references in Blue Book, but I also found independent news clippings. But to your point, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Those interviews are valid. Those witnesses, such as this pilot from Albany, Georgia, 1953, are valid. The one thing I say is when you're reviewing the Blue Book files, when you get to the conclusion, just move on to the next case because it's the conclusions that are skewed, not the data contained in the eyewitness testimony. Mm -hmm. And there are generally, you and I know that the numbers of, of unresolved uh, cases or the unidentified cases with Blue Book can be debated, but it's around sure. 700, depending on what sure. analysis that you look at. But the point Correct. being that one, uh, that many of the, that, even though it was a small percentage of cases, 700 is quite a bit of cases that, you know, despite a lot of work and effort could not be solved. And not only that, the real unidentified is probably higher because during a certain era, the Project Grudge era, really, they were heavily, their jobs were essentially debunking everything, that they reviewed older cases and then closed exactly. them um, kind of spuriously. So, I mean, the, there's a lot of data there. Considering how skewed the quote unquote objective investigation of the subject was, and I'm being sarcastic, obviously, uh, to your point, despite how skewed it was towards discounting and explaining away everything, 701. And as many of us in the field have stated, if you have one valid UFO case with objective data in addition to eyewitness testimony, that's all you need. But we have 701, at least to your point that are in Blue Book. And that's just Blue Book. As we know, over the last uh, 15, 20 years, and I believe you've lectured extensively on this, Alejandro, uh, all of the various governments and military authorities that have released their UFO files. Uh, and certainly, as I alluded to earlier, the British Ministry, Ministry of Defense, in the 1980s and 90s, there was a huge prevalence of triangular UFO reports originally starting in Wales in 1983. In fact, my friend, I, I just have it sitting right here. This is an article that was sent, and you can see the headline there, A Flying Triangle of Fear. That's from Wales, 1983. But over time, it's as if the activity tended to shift from west to east across the Midlands of England until in Essex County, we had a huge sighting wave of these triangular UFOs documented in newspaper accounts, documented in military files. And ironically enough, it was in the mid to late 80s where those occurred up until and including 1989, which, of course, November 29th, 1989 was the first sighting in a wave of sightings in Belgium. And when one looks at a map, 
when you go from the southeast corner of Essex County in the UK and you go across the English Channel, we're only talking 100 miles until you hit the Belgian border. So for an object flying by air at almost any speed, it doesn't take you long to get from Essex County in the UK over into Belgian airspace. And so that's what's interesting. When you look at all of these cases, Alejandro, as I say, no one case exists in a vacuum. We have to look at the totality of evidence. And when you do, you begin to see these patterns emerge. And that's the one thing that I really try to articulate. I'm trying to find patterns in the data and there do appear to be patterns in the data. And again, it's indicative, suggestive that we're dealing with a tangible reality, something that cannot summarily be dismissed. And it's very interesting, the more data sets you, you receive, and I've received at least 50 people now wanting to share their sightings since the unidentified episode has aired. And so as I get information out there, and I, I, I've mentioned this many times, perhaps to you as well, uh, when I wrote my book in 2013, my goal, rather naively, I'll be honest, was to get the information out there because people were basically directing this false narrative that, well, these triangles weren't seen until the 1980s. That just happened to coincide with stealth technology. Well, uh, I've documented cases going back at least to the 1940s, perhaps even the late 1800s in scientific journals. And so uh, it's interesting, but when I got the book out there, I had an influx of additional reports and now trying to get the information out through the vehicle of this unidentified episode, I've hit a raw nerve. And there's many people that have written to me just in the last few days stating what you described, what you articulated in that one case echoed what I saw in 1983 or in 1971. And so, as I like to say with the UFO subject, it's not that I believe all these people because I'm not interested in belief. That's faith-based. That's religion as far as I'm concerned. But what does the data reflect? And the data reflects that these reports of triangles have been around for decades worldwide. Uh, even the, the talking about military reports, even the Danish Defense Intelligence Service in November of 1957 were reporting uh, and documenting and investigating cases of and this was their term, I always like to say this, in the media at the time, triangular spaceships is what they were calling them. And I even found a Reuters News Service article from April 1958 that describes Reuters investigator, reporter, interviewing a woman in the village of Brohir in Denmark who describes seeing a dark, silent, large, triangular spaceship. Again, the term they used in the newspaper article. The Reuters news service confirmed 20 other villagers attested to the woman's sighting and stated they saw it as well. What's interesting is we see another interesting characteristic emerge from that report, one that carries out time and time again. The villagers also described several horseshoe shaped objects flying out of the triangle. And we have many reports worldwide over the decades of lights or objects entering and exiting these large triangular platforms. So it just gets more and more bizarre as you look at it. These objects morph. These objects have objects entering and exiting the vehicles. They can hover and then go hypersonic without generating a sonic boom. So all of these things, when you roll it together, is extremely bizarre. And interestingly enough, a year before the producer contacted me for Unidentified, I had received a call from Chris Mellon. He had read my book and was very fascinated with my research. And so prior to meeting uh, in doing the production, we had already established a dialogue and we spoke for about an hour and a half that first day. And it was very intriguing to talk to someone of his stature, uh, having worked at the Pentagon, the third highest ranking intelligence uh, official. And whereas we can talk about it in UFO circles, Chris is talking matter of factly that when I was at the Pentagon, I was trying to look at all special access programs to see, do we have anything even close to the performance capabilities exhibited by these triangular UFOs. And he told me then, and I believe he may have even echoed it towards the end of the episode and unidentified, he couldn't find anything that came close. And even to this day, probably, uh, we don't have anything close to the performance capabilities. And so, as I like to say, I, I don't want people to believe in UFOs. I don't want people to believe what I'm saying. Simply look at the evidence and make up your own mind. People have an opinion on UFOs. Most of the time it's uneducated. Look at the data, formulate your own opinion. And I think if you have an open mind and yet are objective and willing to concede, many of these can be discounted as conventional aircraft or other things. There's still this residing body of information that begs to be answered. 
Mm -hmm. And I think you and I would argue also to have some discernment because there are people who look into UFOs with a little bit too open of a mind oh. and go oh, a little further goodness. that way. Well, and, and, and on that note, as you know, my methodology is that one thing I think that Chris was attracted to in reading my book. Everything that I discuss, I cite my references. And often in this field, as you know, there are many people that are making their living off of this subject that tell the most outlandish conspiratorial tales based on government insiders who they can't mention and based on spurious government docu documents that have no established provenance. So as I like to say, if someone's telling you something, you damn well better ask them where they're getting the information and never ever take a UFO researcher at face value. Verify the information yourself. Mm -hmm. And speaking of kind of the credibility in Chris Mellon, uh, you had mentioned a little bit, but this guy was the uh, former United States Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Intelligence. We mentioned the uh, Senate Select Committee on, Telev tel on Intelligence, of which he was the staff director. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, for you and I, having researched this field for so long, and now Chris kind of just becoming active, really since the New York Times article and since he joined to the stars with Elizondo and, and Tom DeLonge and some of these other guys mm -hmm. to look into all of this stuff. And they started the television show Unidentified. The world's changed in our arena. <laughs> what was it like, you know, working with Chris and uh, speaking with him, you know, uh, someone of his stature? Well, I, I was impressed. Uh, you know, certainly I appreciate the work that he has done, you know, to protect this nation in his official role when he was at the Pentagon, something that I think people gloss over when they reference him uh, and his work on the UFO subject. Um, but beyond UFOs, I mean, he's done a great deal of work in, within the intelligence community. Um, I'd like to think that he, with his background, uh, brings a certain level of gravitas to the subject and certainly to the show. Uh, in fact, when I was in, in my initial dialogue with the producer, I kind of intimated that I'll do the show if you'll let me talk about my research, but I'd really like Chris to come out and talk to me because we already had that rapport established. And I, we actually agreed on many things with regard to the triangular UFOs, the unusual characteristics, the things that simply cannot summarily be discounted or dismissed based on conventional aircraft. And, uh, you know, he definitely brings some weight. Uh, I know there's a lot of skepticism on the part of many in the UFO field, that this is maybe part of a large disinformation campaign. Uh, I can't speak to that. I have no proof of that, nor do the people making those accusations. And uh, certainly I think you've been following that much more closely than myself, but I've always made the comment that in the UFO field over the last 30 years now, uh, for people that others are suspicious of that are making statements about those individuals, have you met that individual? Have you talked to them one-on-one? -on -one? I'll never forget in 2000 at the International MUFON Symposium in St. Louis, Missouri, I was uh, receiving some really nasty feedback from some of my own investigators and state section directors at the time because I sat down and had lunch with the arch skeptic Phil Class. And just because I have lunch with somebody doesn't mean I agree with them, doesn't mean I endorse them. But as I countered to them when they said, I can't believe that you sit down with a skeptic like that. You know, he spreads disinformation. You know, nobody really knows his agenda. And I said, well, how better to try to get to know the man than break bread with him and have a lunch, have a meal. And uh, the one thing I found was that he was extremely knowledgeable with regard to radar. My friend who was my uh, actual source for information in my book, uh, uh, Richard Taylor, he was uh, uh, retired from the FAA. But I sat there and enjoyed the conversation of them discussing the radar development and the various types of radar and the improvements over the last several years. He was no idiot. I certainly didn't agree with him on UFO matters. Uh, and I even got him to dial back a conventional explanation for the January 5th, 2000 case where he said all these police officers saw the planet Venus. And I politely was going back and forth with him and he actually backpedaled that explanation in his uh, Skeptics UFO newsletter, the Sun newsletter that he published at the time. Uh, but, you know, how better to get to know someone than to talk with them, than to meet with them? And um, I find it interesting on a larger scale, Alejandro, the big thing that many lecturers have, I want to say, made a living off of, and I'm sure you can agree with me on this, is talking about disclosure. Disclosure's coming. Well, we've been hearing that since the 1950s. 
uh, and it never, never has arrived. And I always say, if the past is prologue, I'm not getting my hopes up. But it's interesting, since the Pentagon program has been declassified and since uh, the To the Stars Academy has come out and now has this unidentified show, and they are, to your point, I think it was excellent in your introductory remarks, you mentioned the fact this show sets itself apart from your average run-of-the-mill UFO entertainment, and that's what most of the shows are, let's be honest. They are budging the needle on Capitol Hill with legislators. And there is traction, there is movement taking place behind the scenes. And I find it interesting, those same people that have been pontificating about their version of disclosure and essentially trying to predict the future and what's going to happen. And most of them have never worked in intelligence circles, so I really don't think they're qualified to talk to it much. They are the first to lodge accusations against these people that appear to be moving towards disclosure. Right. And I find it interesting that I think these other researchers want disclosure, but they want it their way. They don't want these people to be the, the messengers, the heralders of disclosure. They want to be the messengers of disclosure. So there's an interesting dynamic playing out within the UFO community with many different personalities on that, on that very subject. Mm -hmm. And kind of to your point, talking to witnesses, talking to skeptics, uh, learning their perspective, uh, you know, throughout the years talking to military witnesses, often they don't come forward because of jocularity. They don't want to be made fun of. They don't feel like uh, it's something that they feel like it's something that's frowned upon. And right. what's interesting about Unidentified and what we've been seeing kind of play out on the show is I think that the, the show backs that up. That certainly mm -hmm. all of these gentlemen have said, I never told anybody about my sighting right. before. I mean, right. a lot of these guys are saying that because I didn't want to be ridiculed. It didn't seem like it was okay. And two significant things that have resulted from Unidentified or, or the group and their mm -hmm. efforts is one, the Navy coming forward and saying, yes, it is okay. We want to hear your reports. And two, because they've had this show where they've got other military people, they feel like, you know, it's okay for me to come out and tell these other military people what my sighting was. And I think that's counter, counterintuitive for everybody. Everybody thinks it's all locked down, but a right. lot of this are, are people kind of um, self uh, censoring themselves as Absolutely. opposed to government censoring them. Our mutual friend, John Alexander has referenced that many times in his lectures. And in fact, I think he, he really sums it up best. And I love the line from his lectures that he gives. And I've, I've quoted him many times in my lectures, uh, reporting a UFO in the military is not a career advancing move. Right. <laughs> so I, I think that sums it up. And to your point, most of this is not officially sanctioned suppression. It's personal suppression of the information. You know, people, no one wants to be laughed at. Let's be honest. Nobody wants to be ridiculed. And certainly these military officers in many cases do not want to be ridiculed. All right. Let's get to some of these questions. One more th comment, actually, real sure. quick, uh, before we get to some of these questions. Another characteristic of these sightings. So, for instance, if you look at the numbers, I think the most uh, what people see are points of light at a distance. Right. Some of those are, you know, Venus or other misidentifications. But even right. unidentified has covered some cases where these things are zipping around. Other cases that are in unidentified as well, but you get out in public are something that is seen very quickly or for a short period of time. Sure. But one characteristic of triangles, these black triangles that is different from others, is they're not shy that no. often in the reports they're floating there for a period of time right, right above people's heads or like some of these witnesses very slowly kind of cruising by that's the other exciting things about uh, the thing about the triangular sighting they're they're more apparent they're, they're more willing it seems like to to display themselves no you're absolutely correct and you know you've often heard me reference these as being unambiguous ufo sightings it's yeah. not a matter of seeing a point of light in the sky for two to three seconds and was that a meteor was that just a glare on the windshield these things are very much for lack of a better term in your face and uh one of the characteristics which is not in my profile but just something i'd like to touch on with regard to that I've interviewed witnesses in the UK. I've interviewed witnesses in, in Europe. I've interviewed witnesses in the United States and even Canada where they've described the triangle hovering directly above their car as they were going down a major interstate. 
And um, there was one woman uh, and her daughter, I'll never forget, I, I have a recording of it, uh, in the UK back in the 1980s during this wave of sightings that I mentioned. And they had a sunroof on their car. And it was one of those things where they just had this like suddenly weird feeling and they almost instinctively, without crashing the car, did one of these and looked up and saw this triangle keeping pace with them. Interestingly mm -hmm. enough, uh, 1973 newspaper article from Southern Illinois described, uh, I believe it was Bartelso, Illinois, uh, a teenage couple were driving down uh, a small county road and they looked up and saw this triangular object. At first they had seen lights flitting off in the distance and suddenly the light moved towards them very quick and they could see that it was lights affixed to this large triangular platform. And in that case, they even described, which is another characteristic, superstructure, girders on the underside, which is very reminiscent of the Hudson Valley sightings that we had from 83 to 86, 89. And um, so there are numerous accounts of these things, to your point, not in a soybean field, but directly over a major highway or interstate. And certainly, as in unidentified, I think they did a good job touching on the Taconic Parkway in the Hudson Valley, where we had hundreds, if not thousands of eyewitnesses that saw this structured craft. Again, not just lights, but structured craft. Now, inevitably, uh, something you're very used to, whenever you talk about these cases, the question always arises about the TR-3B, which was featured uh, in the show, yeah. um, but people want to know what do you think of the TR-3 series, some of them are calling, or sure. the possibility of a, of a TR-3B, which uh, maybe you can explain for those who are unfamiliar with the term what that is. Sure. Well, as with any of these wild stories, and that's what it is, a wild story, as you and I have lectured independently, and we always say the same thing, and that's why we love each other so much, is the fact that you have to go to the original source. Where did the story start? The story goes back to a man by the name of Edgar Fouché, who claims that he was working on top secret classified black projects and that we had this triangular aircraft. Uh, it, 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 he talks about the dynamics, the physics behind how it operates and uh, basically did the lecture circuit in the mid 90s. Uh, he has since passed on. He's no longer with us, but his claim and that's all it is. We have no physical evidence that there's validity to the story. There's no official documents through and some, with some official provenance to back up his story. So it is just that a story from one man and no corroboration whatsoever. But it's interesting. And it's from a sociological standpoint, it's interesting. Now the TR three B is referenced left and right on the internet and it's become an urban myth. It's, it, it's just this story that just feeds upon itself. And many of the videos people will post, they'll say, look, it's the TR-3B. We don't know that there's a TR-3B that exists officially. Uh, it goes back to the claims of one man. And that one man made a lot of other outrageous claims later in life and appear to have some type of mental imbalance, uh, some of the posts towards the very end. Um, so if you can show me official documentation this exists, if you have people that can help corroborate and can show that they have the credentials, which that's another thing is question. There were questions surrounding the credentials that he offered, that he may not have had the credentials that he claimed to have had. Um, you know, and anytime you make a claim like that, the onus is on you to provide evidence to back that up, not on myself to critique it. And it is certainly a wild story. Even if, let's play devil's advocate, even if his story was valid, how does that explain the sightings in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s worldwide? It doesn't. And you have to look, as I mentioned earlier, the totality of evidence before you hang your hat on one explanation. Mm -hmm. Now, there are uh, delta-shaped uh, top secret projects, it seems, out there. Uh, Absolutely. have been captured, but in all of these videos, there are contrails or there are indications of, of physics and propulsion that we're used to. Traditional not propulsion, correct. Mm -hmm. there, there was a fascinating case, I believe it was Wichita, Kansas, where a professional photographer captured one of those objects you were just describing. Clearly, it looks like an equilateral triangle. Uh, the photo has been analyzed. It's not doctored in any way, shape, or form. However, you have characteristic contrails, like you would see with conventional military aircraft or commercial aircraft. And even uh, the late uh, Professor Paul Ziss, 
who uh, was 30 years in the area of advanced propulsion technology, uh, clandestine classified projects, he even made reference, and I quote him in my book, that you, if it was just a triangular object people were reporting, it might be something that you might see near Edwards Air Force Base. And that was kind of a nudge, nudge, wink, wink moment. Uh, and in the interest of full disclosure, I didn't realize at the time, but he was actually getting ready to go into hospice. He was fighting cancer. And about a month after my book was published, uh, I believe it was a month, month and a half, he did pass away. So I had the opportunity to, to speak with him he had nothing to lose by coming forward. And even he conceded that the January 5th, 2000 case and perhaps these others did not seem to be our technology. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple other questions. Here's mm -hmm. one from Janice. She, she asked, what's the latest sighting that has been reported of a triangle? Oh my goodness. Well, if you go to the National UFO Reporting Center, you could probably find some of the latest that are posted. Uh, Peter Davenport, who runs the center, sometimes there's a delay just because he's essentially a one-man operation trying to do it all. Uh, sometimes there's a bit of a delay in getting them posted by maybe a month or so, but uh, that's certainly an area. Uh, I don't have live feed of all the latest, greatest triangle reports. Quite often, it might be months or years later before I hear about them, just because the nature of UFO reporting, as you know, Alejandro, there's not one place that you can go to report. There's multiple avenues. MUFON might have a report, Mutual UFO Network, National UFO Reporting, independent researchers. In fact, uh, the Hudson Valley case, uh, it was interesting. After my book came out, I was contacted by a gentleman. I'll use his first name, Mark. And Mark said, David, I read your book, utterly fascinating re research that you put together. I just want you to know you wrote about the Hudson Valley wave. I was an independent investigator investigating those cases. And I have a one inch thick binder of reports and maps. I'm out of the UFO field now, but I see what you're doing. I'm going to send you my research materials. And so I was able to receive these original interviews and reports with Hudson Valley witnesses. So there are various avenues and it's very, very difficult. And that's where the work comes in and trying to gather this information and collate it and make some sense out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, Janice also had another question, mm -hmm. actually. Uh, what is the average flight altitude of triangle sightings? Thank you for asking that question, Janice. Uh, actually, that's another one of the characteristics I outline. Uh, there's uh, 20 total, 10 primary ones, but one of those involves low altitude flight. And to answer your question specifically, most witnesses state it was about 100 to 200 feet above my head. Many witnesses described, and there was a case, there was actually a wave of sightings in 74 that were also tracked on radar and F-106 interceptors were sent up to try to chase these uh, UFOs. Uh, the police officers that were some of the witnesses described the fact that they were just skirting the treetops. That's how low these objects were. People have asked me, why are they flying that low? We put forth one possible explanation in the episode of Unidentified, as Chris points out, and I tend to agree with with some of these. They may be doing some low-level reconnaissance or mapping operation. Another one that I often will cite, and it's just using our technology and the way we operate aircraft, maybe they're flying under the radar. If we're flying into enemy territory, we're not going to flow high. We're going to fl fly low and try to evade radar detection. Perhaps the low altitude flight is just to do that. In fact, the January 5th, 2000 case, uh, I love the story because thinking now in a post 9-11 world, this would not be possible. But I gave the first public lecture on the case since I was the lead investigator at the uh, Eureka Springs UFO conference for my friend, the late Lou Farish. And as soon as I had finished my presentation, a gentleman came up and put his hand on my shoulder, gave me his business card and stated, Dave, I work with the FAA. If you need assistance getting the radar data from Lambert International Airport, I can help you with that. And so within about, I think, three to four weeks, uh, I'd have to check my notes. We were actually standing in the control tower at Lambert International Airport. Now, again, this was pre 9-11. To think of me just walking in there is just unheard of based on security standards today. But Richard knew all of these people. He helped install the radar system there. And uh, I did speak with the radar operators and they asked me the first question, Janice, uh, how high did these witnesses state this object was flying? What was the estimated altitude? And in many cases, it was around two to 500 feet in that case. And they stated, well, based on where our radar array is located, we may not have picked it up. 
So I use that as a possible reason why some of these objects may be flying so low. Mm -hmm. uh, Janice, she had most of the questions <laughs> that weren't about the TR-3B. So sure. she has another one here. Has there been a documented landing of triangles? <laughs> I, I almost feel like I, I'm, I'm psychically sending you questions, Janice. These are all really good <laughs> ones. Uh, I use that as an example of when you're looking at hundreds of cases, and as I did, established a profile for this subset of UFOs, namely looking at what are the characteristics we see time and time again. But let's look at the other side of the, the coin, the flip side. What don't we see? And the one thing I don't see in any of the reports, not one, is a landing of one of these triangular UFOs. And that didn't dawn on me until after I had published the book, actually, as I because I was focused on common characteristics. And then I started realizing I don't have one report of a triangle landing. The only one that might, and I use this very carefully, might be indicative of that is the Bentwaters or Woodbridge UFO sighting where mm. the triangle hovered, but I believe, and Alejandro, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe they found three indentations where that object had been. So potentially it had set down or had some type of landing gear. But that one was a little bit different, wasn't it? it that was a relatively small triangle. It's not of the scale that we see with these larger triangles. So I don't know if the Bentwaters triangle is the same type of craft we're looking at with these large objects, which more often than not are estimated to be two to 300 feet in length. Mm -hmm. And there was a little bit of discrepancy about the shape, but uh, the yes. main witness, uh, Penison, Correct. he walked around the object. You're right. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a smaller object. Um, yeah. Very credible case. And more sightings were associated with that. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see some other questions. This is an interesting question, and I'm not sure why he asked it, but uh, maybe <laughs> he'll share. Uh, he's in these, these talks a lot. A sure. Dastra recording is asking if he can have you say your name again. Oh, okay. Uh, David Marler. Wow. Oh, maybe he's going to cut that video and use it. <laughs> something. Um, let's see. Somebody is asking, this is a side note. Uh, I might know more about this. They're asking, are, is MUFON still collecting data, even though they've got this current shakeup? Uh, as far as I know, uh, their data collection has not been affected by I no think leadership issue which no, we can get into right yeah we don't need to go down that path but no MUFON as an organization and i know many people as you do alejandro at the various state chapters state directors state section directors field investigators uh i'm still in touch with many of those across the country although i'm an independent investigator and uh, they're still out there collecting reports doing the investigation and really doing essentially the grunt work for the organization Oh, uh, right. And uh, and just so people know, the, Mu the MUFON is a mutual UFO network. They've been around since 1969, kind of in response to Blue Book closing, uh, a bunch of civilians doing research. Uh, and they have chapters in every state. So yes. that's who MUFON is, if you're not aware. Actually, he was asking for the uh, Ad Astra, the name he wanted, was a TR3B guy, which is uh, Edward oh. Fouché, right? Uh, Edgar. Edgar Fouché. Edgar Fouché. Yeah. F-O-U-C-H-E. Okay, here's another great question. You talked about the Belgian UFO wave. Yes. And uh, this is actually related to a question someone asked me about your show, and I'll follow up with that okay. question after this one. Okay. But Adastra is asking, there was a famous photo with that Belgian uh, triangular wave, and, and he's yes. asking, can David confirm the famous Belgian wave photo of a triangle was fully debunked. Uh, I will answer that with a resounding yes. And I'm not saying that because that's my opinion. Uh, one of my dear friends who I've gotten to know and who has actually been here to my home in New Mexico is uh, Patrick Ferren, who was the leading investigator with the civilian organization at the time called SOBEPS. They've now reformulated it. They're, they're called COBEPS. And they actually operated out of Brussels worked uh, on an unofficial capacity with the Belgian Air Force to investigate that entire wave of sightings. And uh, much to their chagrin, uh, that uh, photo had been debunked and uh, the individual, I believe, had even come forward and acknowledged that they had. But Patrick knew the individual personally, his investigators knew the per them personally. I'm saying that 
I trust their judgment. They were directly involved with the witness. I had no direct interaction with the individual. Uh, and it's really a shame because it's one of those examples in ufology where people, skeptics and others, uh, even those that don't, that don't call themselves skeptics, will say, aha, see, the photo was faked, therefore, all the sightings are debunked. And that's ridiculous because again, we have in the case uh, of one of the sightings, we had four separate NATO ground-based tracking stations tracking one of these objects. At the same time, civilian witnesses who are actually off-duty gendarmes having a party observed the UFO, reported it. And it was based on that criteria that they decided to launch the two F-16 jet interceptors and Eves Mealsberg was the pilot of the one that had repeatedly locked on with his onboard radar. But every time he locked on, the object would tear away at blistering speeds and velocities, as well as increasing and decreasing in altitude. And the G's that were exhibited in those maneuvers would have killed a human pilot as we know it. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can correct me if I get this name wrong too, which is possible, but uh, someone that people could look up who lectured on this was uh, Colonel Wilfred de Brouwer, correct, uh, who was in charge of the investigation for the yeah. Belgian. Uh, who was he with? Was he with the Air Force or Belgian Belgian Air Force? He was uh, then Colonel uh, de Brouwer and then later General de Brouwer. Hmm. Yep, I've met him and I've seen him lecture. Very, very credible. Very intelligent. Something you would expect uh, him to be a general. Absolutely. Um, the follow up question that someone had asked me after watching Unidentified was. If these triangular sightings are so close and they're, you know, they last so long, why aren't there more pictures or videos or are there any at all? Well, that's a very good question. And one I often get asked when I do lectures across the country on the subject, and I would argue there, there's a plethora of photographs and videos. Unfortunately, they're on the Internet. And I always like to say technology is a double edged sword. Uh, when the Hudson Valley wave occurred, wouldn't it be wonderful if they had smartphones back then and they could have all filmed that? That would be almost a smoking gun, if you will, to have that many hundreds of people filming from various angles and locations this object that was over the Taconic Parkway. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have that technology back then. Uh, but now everyone has a smartphone. But Likewise, every high school kid has photo editing and digital manipulation software where you can generate your fake UFO video. In fact, there's organizations that actively will post falsified UFO videos. And Alejandro, you're very familiar with them as well. We've discussed this. So there's an abundance of videos and photographs. Go on YouTube, try, type triangular UFO, type in triangular UFO in Google. A triangular UFO photo, you'll find numerous people purporting to have triangular videos and photographs. A gentleman recently from the Midwest sent me a very crude uh, video from his cell phone that he said was clearly a triangular UFO. The only problem with that was, and this gets back to your earlier point, Alejandro, when I looked at it, the first thing I noticed was not what I saw, but what I heard. It was a conventional jet engine. And I could also see that these were, in, in fact, landing lights on the landing gear of a commercial airliner, which were reflecting on the fuselage and the, the wing. There was nothing mysterious about it, but there were quite often you'll be baited with things like that. They just wanted to see, you know, was he going to say this is a triangular UFO? Most of the videos, the valid videos can usually be debunked. And many people, in fact, just in the last three days since the unidentified errors uh, has aired, uh, I've received a number of photos and videos uh, and I get, asked, what's my opinion? I don't have an opinion on photos and videos. I leave that up to the video experts because that's not my area of expertise. If I told you I thought that was valid, I'd probably be proven wrong. And so the video analysts, that is within their scope of practice to analyze that and the, the photo experts. Uh, I'm not a photo analyst. I'm not a video expert. So if I get something that I feel is worthy of being investigated, I will contact individuals that I know through the networking within UFO channels. We know a couple people, Alejandro, that can look at those videos, look at those photographs, and with a more professional opinion, be able to weigh in on the validity. I agree with so much that you said there. And, you know, even with the, the Nimitz situation, which is, of course, a great case, uh, featured as <laughs> kind of the pinnacle case featured on season one and even repeated on season two uh, with uh, military pilots. 
What makes that case so strong is a credible witness testimony, radar, Absolutely. all of this information that corroborate. The actual videos were released were so short, there's not much you can even make of them. Um, Correct. So you have to rely on the experts who analyze them. And like Luis Elizondo has said, there's plenty of military experts who looked at those. Um, so the armchair guys really are putting their work up against the top ep experts that the military has, which is well, kind of a tall order. And quite often in the UFO community, some will say, well, what do you think of this video? What do you think of this UFO photo? And really what they're asking is, what do you feel? Do you think this is real? Do you think it's legitimate? And uh, again, my opinion doesn't matter when it comes to photographic analysis or video analysis. That's not my area of expertise. And I think more people in this field need to pull back their emotions and don't weigh in based on emotion, weigh in based on a cognitive approach. Do you have the capability, the know-how, the knowledge to truly analyze that video and weigh in with an opinion? And uh, I'll be the first to tell you, and I'm, I'm so glad, Alejandro, I wanted to mention this before I forget. One of the, the, the small sound bites that they used in the episode, because we filmed all day, as you know how these productions go, we filmed all day and so much was cut out. And some that I really wish w the audience could have actually seen. There were some things cut out that were very crucial to the argument of these triangles and their existence. Um, but one of the comments that I often make, and I'm being completely humble and completely honest, which I always try to be with my audience, uh, I state, I have a lot of data. Data doesn't necessarily equate to answers. And if more UFO researchers would concede that point, I think we might be a little bit further along in trying to understand this mystery because so many people pull on these threads that lead down this rabbit hole of conspiracy theories and other things. And um, whatever we do, it has to be data driven, valid data documented through official sources that we can point to and try to put this together. It doesn't matter what David Marler believes. It only matters what David Marler can show you in the data. And again, mm -hmm. citing references so you don't take my word for it, you can take that information. And I hope with my book, it can be a springboard for other researchers. I, I wrote a book. It didn't provide answers, but it, I think provided clarity with regard to this subset of reports, both in characteristics and in history. But I'm hoping someone will take it to the next level. In fact, uh, another question I get asked quite often at conferences is, have you looked at the relationship of alien abduction with regard to triangular UFOs? And I haven't. Mine was more of a historical analysis. But I often turn that question on people and say, I haven't pursued that avenue of research, but why don't you take the lead on that and in two or three years, come back and let me know what you find? Because quite often I find they want you to do that. You do the research. Well, I've done my research. Now, why don't you pursue that? If you think it's a valid line of inquiry, by all means, please pursue it and share with us what you find. Yeah, it's funny you say that because I've used that line too because we're just civilian people out here trying to look into this just like everyone else. We're, we have our yeah, own priority. We, we don't do this full time. We do this part time uh, around our jobs, around our family, our children. And so uh, we need all the help we can get. If we can get more active participants in the field that are willing to adopt an objective methodology and looking at this information, I think we can budge the needle and maybe make some traction, maybe not find the answer, the smoking gun. I think that's a ridiculous aspiration. But as every field of science, every discipline we've seen, there is no aha moment more often than not. It is a systemic working towards a goal with small discoveries that are baby steps that lead us in a direction that ultimately may lead to major scientific revelations. And the mm -hmm. UFO subject is no different. Everyone is looking for that gov one government insider, that one government document that's going to blow the lid wide, wide open. And of course, there's one circulating right now, which I think you've been following, Alejandro, that's circulating quite prolifically in the UFO circles. And people are saying, is this the smoking gun? I, in my humble opinion, after 30 years active in this field, there is not going to be a smoking gun. It's going to be methodical research that leads us to revelations that may lead us to the ultimate revelation, perhaps decades or centuries from now. Mm -hmm. Now, despite what you said about uh, video and photo analysts, I'm going to put you on the spot anyway. <laughs> um, to the Stars uh, has this video uh, that Tom DeLong really likes, and it's a triangular uh, shaped object. Mm -hmm. There's a burst of light and it disappears. Mm -hmm. um, do you have data 
on that video. I don't, and I actually don't believe I've seen that video now that you oh, mentioned really? that. Is that on their website? It is in one, I think it's it's in their video, their opening video. Um, okay. But uh, yeah, I'll get that to you and, and we'll see what you think. Sure, um, yeah, I, unfortunately, <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't weigh in on it. I haven't seen it, so but okay. I'd love to. I'd love to see it. <laughs> another couple of questions. Lawrence is asking. Um, here's another one. Is there any correlation between triangles and crop circles that you're aware ah, of? Good question. Uh, uh, haven't been asked that in the past. That's a really good one. Uh, not that I've seen. Uh, now, certainly, there may be data out there or reports. Uh, from the southern uh, portion of the UK, where uh, crop circles have been prolific going back to the early 90s. Uh, but I haven't seen uh, any cases that tie the two together, not saying that they may not be out there. And if they are, and you're aware of some, please send them my way. I would love to see those. Uh, but no strong correlation uh, with mm -hmm. crop circles. Uh, but again, when you look at the historical analysis, uh, crop circles really didn't come to the forefront until roughly 1989, 1990, 1991. Uh, many of the reports I looked at were from the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. So it certainly predated the crop circle phenomenon. So, uh, but none that I found uh, from the 1990s onwards. But uh, again, just because David Marler didn't report it or doesn't know about it doesn't mean it's not out there. So I I'm certainly not the ultimate repository of all things triangle. Uh, I just have a lot mm -hmm. of data, but not certainly every, every report. All right, Adastra is talking about the, the Belgium photo again. He's just saying uh, that it looks so authentic, and it did. And in fact, that's why it fooled people for so long. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, the way that it was built is now out there. The person who faked it, that's how we know it was fake, uh, came out and admitted to it and even demonstrated how he made it and took the photo. So if you go look, you can find that information. And beyond that, if you Google COBEPS, which is C-O-B-E-P-S, uh, you could probably get in touch with Patrick Ferren, who, again, was the lead investigator uh, with the Sobeps group during that wave and who I talked to personally. That's, again, I, I, I based my, my statement on what he told me personally here in my home uh, about three or four years ago when we met. Uh, and we've had many, di many uh, dialogues uh, over the years uh, sharing information. But uh, I would try to, to reach out to Patrick Ferren, and you could really get it from the horse's mouth, someone that directly interfaced with that individual, worked with them. And as I mentioned, it was uh, kind of a point of consternation with Sobeps because they uh, published a voluminous two volume work on their investigation of that famous Belgian wave of UFOs. And unfortunately now in retrospect, uh, they put that image for the cover of their book, uh, which mm -hmm. I think now if they were going to republish it, I don't think they, that would be on the cover of their book. But uh, th that was certainly a point of consternation for them, I think, when they realized that it was not a legitimate photo. Mm -hmm. Well, we're pretty much out of time. So thank you so oh. much, David. Uh, okay. Just for so the audience knows, there are other cases that David looks into. If he's looking into a case, it's going to be more thoroughly uh, gone over than any other case out there or anything else you see. Uh, every one of his lectures and investigations is very eye-opening and informative. So some Thank of you. my favorite stuff. Where should they go if they want to look up more information about you? Absolutely. Well, I, the best point, uh, place would be my website, which is David Marler, M-A-R-L-E-R, U-F-O dot com. And uh, actually, I just published a recent article, Alejandro. I don't think I've even mentioned this to you uh, prior to the show, uh, which I posted on my main page. And so you'll see some updated uh, reports that I've received, both through uh, scrapbooks of old newspapers, interviews with witnesses, one actually from Europe uh, that I include in there. And then also, if you're interested, if you haven't seen my book, there is a link. You just click on the book image and it'll take you to Amazon where you can purchase a copy of the book. And I'm always interested in feedback. So uh, please uh, feel free to reach out and contact me. All right. Great. Thank you. And I do plan on having David on the Rojas Report, which you can find at openmind.tv, uh, my website where you can find uh, some of my stuff. And we'll do a more in-depth uh, interview on some of these UFO cases. But we are here with Den of Geek, who's hosting this. Thank you so much to Den of Geek. Be sure to subscribe to the YouTube page or like the Facebook page if you're watching there. Also, feel free to give us comments and some feedback. 
Uh, you can follow Den of Geek on social media, all social media out there. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us. And until next time, you all have a great evening. <laughs>